Hello there, I'm Ken Record, and I welcome you back to this week's edition of Mining Biblical Truth on John Chapter 3, which I am calling Darkness and Light. In two sections, Nico at night and John points to the light. First of all, because it's it, interesting to learn what we can about uh, Nicodemus and Richard Balcom in, in his book on John has done extensive research into first century uh, genealogy and history to try to discern Nic the Nicodemus family tree, which I've uh, displayed here from his research. And he has determined that Nicodemus had a son named Gorion. And he also discovered uh, that a number of first century Jewish families would tend to repeat names every other generation. So Nicodemus had Gorion, and Gorion had three sons, another Nicodemus, Hezekiah, and Joseph. And um, so uh, this Nicodemus likely would name his son Gorion. But Gor this Gorion, uh, Balcom believes, was one was what listed as one of the three representatives to negotiate the surrender of Jerusalem in 70 AD to the Romans. So he was still a very high up uh, practicing uh, Jew at that time. Uh, according to Josephus also, his father Nicodemus died during the siege. But Josephus also records that no Christians died uh, during the siege, and that's because they had all left. And we'll come back to that in a minute. The um, so was Nicodemus a believer? Was he saved? Well, the only evidence for conversion was his participation in preparing Jesus for burial. But in that, he was only honoring Jewish tradition. He's never mentioned in the Book of Acts, which I think is curious. Historical documents show him remaining a Sanhedrin member. And his son remained a devout Jew and leader, which so certainly he didn't have any, his ongoing family didn't have any uh, uh, apparent Christians. So what about, why did all the Christians leave? Well, they obeyed Jesus in chapter 24 of Matthew when he said, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And Josephus understood that. So was Nicodemus genuinely open to discovering who Jesus was? Well, he comes to him and he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent from God. Rabbi and teacher basically mean the same thing. And Jesus responds, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless one is born again. Now, I substituted here, Amen, for truly, because if, if Jesus was speaking Hebrew, he was probably speaking Greek. But if he chose to speak Hebrew, the correct term would be Amen, because it means it is true. Uh, Nicodemus has come on behalf of his group of Pharisees, which is why he says we. And Jesus, when he responds and says, you, uh, I say to you, that you in Greek is plural. And we don't have a plural you in English, except if you use the southern version, y'all, <laughs> which would actually be a very good translation here. <laughs> um, the um, That's why it's not clear that, that, that Jesus is addressing this whole group, not just Nicodemus as an individual. Uh, but the significance also, of when Jesus says, truly, truly, at the beginning of a statement, he's not adhering to traditional rabbinical form or what we would call prayer form. We say amen at uh, truly, let it be, uh, at the end of a prayer, because we're asking God for it. But Jesus says the beginning because he's saying, it's already answered. If I say it, it's true. <laughs> you know, it's like, what uh, 
whatever I do on earth is is fixed in heaven. Uh, which indicates he's not just another rabbi. He's not just another teacher. And that, that's Nicodemus' problem is, is he doesn't he doesn't see the real Jesus. You know, I think what Nicodemus is proposing here is to is for Jesus to join the Pharisees. He's saying, let's work together. It'll be great. We'll sit around the campfire, make s'mores, and sing kumbaya. Well, Jesus says, Ixnay on the kumbaya. <laughs> it ain't happening. And then Nicodemus reappears twice more in John's gospel. He doesn't appear at all in the other gospels, by the way. Uh, in chapter 7, he's horrified by the wickedness of the Sanhedrin brothers, but he doesn't leave them. Jesus sees his heart, which is not repentant. An interesting question that Jesus could have asked him is, have you been baptized by water by John? If not, why not? We could even speculate that Nicodemus might have been one of the, the men who was sent to interrogate John. We don't know. Or maybe his son was. Uh, Nicodemus wants to tap into Jesus' power, but he sees no need to be washed clean in order to be born again. Even those in Christian ministry can make the same mistake of expecting God to join them in what they are doing. I learned in a, uh, a course years ago called Experiencing God how important it is to join God where he is working. The basic problem Nicodemus has is that God hasn't called him. For his sovereign reasons, God has not opened the door to the light. And Nicodemus is thus unable to repent and submit in order to join in what God is doing. I realize this is a viewpoint that not all Christians uh, share. Uh, John answers the question about Nicodemus in verse 27 when he says that no one can receive anything unless given from heaven. Now, he's not talking in direct reference to Nicodemus there, but it's the same concept. And also, uh, Jesus is talking about water and the spirit is an allusion to Ezekiel 36, 25, 27, which says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Uh, give, uh, give you, as I think I should say, a, a heart of spirit, a new heart. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments, judgments and do them. It's I will, I will, I will, I will. This is God speaking. God will do it. God sovereignly makes that choice. Uh, I like to think of water and the spirit. This is like a lot of uh, uh, illustrations uh, of Christian doctrine, uh, not at all perfect. But one way to think about it is, is that water and spirit are kind of like the skin prep before, uh, in surgery. Water is like uh, prepping the skin. It's a necessary step before the surgery, but it's not curative. <laughs> You need the surgery to be curative. You need the coming of the spirit. It's like the uh, people that Paul encounters in, in Acts who have who've had the water baptism but have not received the spirit. So why did John position the scene with John the Baptist at this location? Remember, he's not necessarily writing here in chronological order. He's writing things in a thematic pattern. John contrasts with Nicodemus. His disciples are upset that others are baptizing in the same way that the Pharisees are upset by Jesus' miracles without their mandate. They're both envious. Unlike the Pharisees, John submits to God's plan. He's content with his role. Like Job, John recognizes that God gives and takes away and does not question his sovereignty to do so. John says, uh, he must become greater, I must become less. Whereas uh, Nicodemus and the Pharisees, um, 
want to be greater on an equal basis with Jesus. See, John knew his role. John, John could have dropped his ministry and and jumped in line to, to follow Jesus, but he wasn't called to do that. Like Job, John recognizes that God gives and takes away and does not question his sovereignty. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job one twenty one. So my takeaway here is don't be envious of how God is using others. We should be amazed and grateful if he uses us at all. Uh, it's like uh, uh, our our ministry here in this uh, uh, in these YouTube videos and on our website. So we're grateful for that that anyone watches them. <laughs> um, but I share with you the story of the two young rabbis, which is one of my my favorites. These two young rabbis get together. They were both trained by the same uh, uh, rabbi, and so they have the exact same uh, Jewish doctrine. And the one says to the other, <clears throat> I don't get it. We're both trained by the same person. We're both, uh, we both love our disciples. We're both dedicated to our work. And yet, um, uh, I don't understand why you have twice as many disciples as I have. And the other rabbi says, he says, that's not what amazes me. What amazes me is that I have any disciples at all. That's the difference between being envious and being humble. C.S. Lewis said, we have to learn to play great parts without pride and small parts without shame. The Pharisees could not accept a lesser role, and neither could some of John's disciples. John must have baptized a great many people to get the attention of the authorities. What percentage of them do you think became true believers? I'm sure it was probably pretty small. Was John concerned that many of them would not believe? I would say no, because he was doing his job. It was up to the Lord to call them. God is sovereign over new birth in the same way that he is sovereign over the womb. In the case of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Hannah, and Mary, God opens wombs and God opens tombs. You have to be reborn before being resurrected. The subversion of this truth is done by the forces of darkness. I found this quote from a person named Ernest Holmes. It says, we must have a spiritual rebirth. We must be born out of the belief in externalities into the belief in inner realities. And by that, he means our feelings. Out of the belief that we are separated from God into the belief that we are part of a unitary wholeness. This is subversion of Christian doctrine. So, um, before, before I uh, close, a couple weeks ago, I showed you uh, uh, the uh, use of phrasing from an organization called Bible Arc. Uh, and this week, I've done a separate short video uh, showing you an example of bracketing uh, using the first part of John chapter 3. So uh, you can find that, uh, that that's labeled as 4A bracketing uh, following this uh, video on YouTube. And bracketing looks like this. It is rather complicated, <laughs> but very useful. So think about it, question. You might serve God in a ministry like John and have God bring it to an end, like John's came to an end. How, how much will you resent that he, that he who gave takes away? How much will you look forward to what God has planned for you next? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the scriptures this week. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Um, thank you. Uh, that you have chosen us. And, and Lord, we uh, pray that uh, uh, all those that you have chosen uh, will come to faith uh, and very soon. As we wait for Jesus to return. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for watching. Um, 
please take a moment to uh, 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 click uh, uh, like or uh, share with a friend. Uh, please uh, uh, share a link with a, a friend or make a comment on YouTube. We'd love to hear from you. Have a blessed week.